afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome uh, Good to afternoon. the webinar uh, to, the, to commemorate the 70th year of the outbreak of Korean War. My name is Taeung Baek, a professor of law and director of the Center for Korean Studies. The Korean War broke out on Sunday, June 25th in 1950, 4 a.m. local time in Korea. And the North Korean troops had uh, launched their Operation Storm, an all-out uh, attack on the South uh, without any declaration of war. On, war. And uh, uh, on June 27, 1950, uh, the Security Council of the UN recommended that the members of the UN uh, furnish uh, Re the Republic of Korea uh, such assistance uh, as, as may be necessary to prepare the armed attack and to restore international peace and security in the area. In the Korean War, fought from June 25th, 1950 until July 27th, 1953, more than 3 million Koreans died, while millions more became refugee, homeless, and distraught. About 30,000 United States soldiers were also killed in the war. The discussions for formally ending the Korean War and uh, establishing a new peace regime by adopting an end of war declaration and a peace treaty are still not progressing. The Korea and the UN command established by a resolution from the Security Council are still at war after 67 years of the signing of the armistice agreement in 1953. The armistice agreement was signed by limited parties of the commanders of the UN, North Korea and China, and the agreement that defines the international relations surrounding the Korean Peninsula is only an incomplete temporary document. Article five of paragraph six of the agreement recommended the peaceful settlement of the Korean question. And paragraph 62 provided that the armistice agreement shall remain in effect until expressly superseded either by mutually acceptable amendments and additions or by provision in an appropriate agreement for a peaceful settlement at a political level between both sides. For this reason, replacing the armistice agreement with an uh, eventual peace treaty normalizing inter-Korean relations and uh, US-North Korea relations while pursuing the denuclearization of North Korean uh, peninsula, uh, territory are fundamental issues to guarantee the security around the Korea, Korean peninsula. Today, we have a very small event with, uh, however, very distinguished guest participants as a keynote participating as a, a welcome uh, remark uh, uh, the presenter or keynote speaker or a panel spe uh, discussion speakers uh, with a topic, a big topic is permanent peace possible in Korea. I would like to thank all of the participants and also uh, attendees to this webinar uh, to discuss this important uh, matter together. I would like to thank uh, Honolulu Consulate General Office of the Republic of Korea for its generous support for this event. And I also uh, thank uh, my CKS Center for Korean Studies staff, Mercy, Courtney, Doyoung, Claire, uh, as well. Now I would like to introduce uh, today's uh, distinguished guest who will give a brief uh, welcome remark uh, uh, to invite all of you to uh, this uh, very uh, important event today. Uh, the first speaker will be uh, the Consul General of the Republic of Korea uh, based in Honolulu and then uh, Chairman Chairman Park, uh, National Unification Advisory Council, uh, Hawaii, then uh, Emeritus Professor Edward Schulz, uh, who is a Vice President of Asian Research Foundation, will speak. Mr. Chungu. Thank you, Professor Beck. Thank you. Aloha. 안녕하십니까. Uh, 
it is still very awkward for me to speak in front of camera and screen. So I'll be quick and uh, let me uh, read the prepared text for you. Again, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. I would like to first express my sincere thanks to Professor Beck and their Center for Korean Studies for organizing this meaningful webinar. It's good to see some familiar faces that I have not seen during the pandemic. Uh, this webinar casts an important question. Is permanent peace possible in Korea? If you look back on the history, the Korean Peninsula has been on roller coaster, roller coaster ride during the past seven decades, marked by provocations, progresses, brinkmanship, dialogue, economic sanctions, economic cooperation, and so on. The peace on the Korean Peninsula is indeed a daunting goal. However, the Republic of Korea has been making steadfast efforts to achieve denuclearization and establish lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula. The three rounds of inter-Korean summit meetings and the North Korea-US summits prove that the peace process can move forward through dialogue. Despite rocky negotiations and months of impasse since the pandemic, the Korean government is firmly committed to dialogue, as President Moon reiterated during the UN General Assembly in September this year. As you know, one of the three principles of the Moon administration's North Korea policy is zero tolerance of war. The ROC US Security Alliance provides fundamental foundation for the principle. In that sense, I think there is no better place than Hawaii for this webinar to be held. Located in the center of the Pacific, Hawaii is home to the US Indo Pacific Command that directly supports the US forces Korea. On this small but strategically valuable islands, robust diplomatic efforts are made, contributing to stability in the region. It is all, it is all the more so for, so for my consulate because the Rod US Alliance is the linchpin of peace and security in the Northeast Asia and serve as an anchor for Korea's diplomacy, as Minister Kang Kyung Hwa said at the Asia Society two months ago. It is not an exaggeration to say that the relationship between the Republic of Korea and the United States is special. When the pandemic broke out, our two countries immediately started collaborating to ensure the safety of our citizens and share the best practice on fighting the virus. When the other countries were busy banning entries, our two countries kept the door the border open, which is a very exceptional case when you look back at 2020. 70 years have passed since the Korean War started. As the Korean government faithfully continues to pursue the peace process, supported by unwaving Korea-US alliance, I hope that a seminar like the one today will provide great insight on the Korean Peninsula issue. Personally, I am excited to hear from Professor Moon, as well as distinguished panelists. Thank you. Mahalo. Kamsamda. Thank you very much. Our next uh, speaker will be Mr. Chewon Bark, Chairman of a National Unification Advisory Council in Honolulu. Thank you, Director Beck, for allowing me to uh, give a short remarks as a part of the Korean American community here in Hawaii. I'm honored to be able to share the opportunity to speak on this webinar with the Consul General Kim Jun Gu, Dr. Edward Schultz of the Asian Research Foundation, as well as with uh, each of the panel members. I am especially uh, excited to hear from uh, Professor Moon Jong In, special advisor to Korean President Moon. What an honor it is to be amongst you all today. 
I'm the president of the Hawaii chapter of the National Unification Advisory Council. Our role as the NUAC is to provide a, a perspective and a consensus, suggestions on unification policies to the Korean president. Our chapter represents a Korean, a Korean American community across the Pacific, including Guam, Saipan, and the state of Hawaii. This year, 2020, is the 70th anniversary of the Korean War began. The Korean War, which began in 1950, came to a temporary ceasefire with the signing of the Korean Armistice Agreement in 1953. However, this, this is just a pause in the war, and the Korean Peninsula technically remain in a state of war. The Korean Armistice Agreement of 1953 was merely a, a temporary suspension of hostilities and did not complete, completely end the war. Therefore, the Korean Peninsula is in a constant state of political, militaristic, and the social instability and remain in the dangerously confrontational situation. Fortunately, we are creating an era of peace on the current Korean Peninsula, where since the Pyeongchang Peace Olympics, we have held three inter-Korean summits and two summits between the United States and the North Korea. However, the military tensions between South and North Korea are perpetuated by the uh, instability of the armistice system and the inhabitants of the Korean Peninsula uh, living in a fear of another war. In recent months, President Moon Jae-in urged the United Nations and the international community to support formally ending the Korean War. He said that the time has come to remove the uh, tragedy lingering in the Korean Peninsula, and peace in the Korean Peninsula will guarantee the peace in the Northeast Asia as a whole, and one step further, bring positive changes to the uh, world, uh, world order as well. I strongly agree with the President Moon's statement. We must overcome the terrible pain of warfare, put an end to the unfinished war through the declaration of the end of war on Korean Peninsula. The declaration of the end of war is a political promise, internally and externally proclaiming the end of war. And I think, it, is, should, it should be the first step toward creating permanent peace in the Korean Peninsula. With this in mind, I look forward to the discussions and exchange of views at today's conference. I'm very optimistic that we will find many productive ideas leading toward peace in the Korean Peninsula in this conference. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today, and I'd like to extend my warmest aloha to everyone in this conference. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Professor uh, Ned Schultz, who is an emeritus professor uh, from this University of Hawaii, uh, former Dean of SPA School of Pacific Asian Studies, and also former director of this Center for Korean Studies that I am inheriting at this time uh, the important uh, work. And he is vice president of Asian Research Foundation, who is uh, that is often uh, supporting our center in many ways. Professor Schultz. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, aloha, aloha kako, and of course, yorobun anihashimika. A real pleasure to join you this afternoon. And uh, I'm disappointed we can't actually be face to face and have long dialogues confronting each other, but that's sort of the factor of this time we're in. The uh, Asian Research Foundation has actually been in Honolulu for over 25 years. It's just not uh, the most well-known foundation. And uh, our focus is essentially to support Korean studies. And in supporting Korean studies, uh, we try to give grants. We, are we hope to, we, we try to host conferences and other academic endeavors related to Korean studies. Uh, we're particularly interested in trying to enhance dialogue between North and South Korea. And in that uh, context, we have had conferences in different international venues that are somewhat neutral between the North and the South. And uh, we've had some very interesting, very significant dialogues, we believe, 
and we certainly hope to, to continue, continue this endeavor in, in the future. Um, if you folks know of some important uh, conference or some important seminar that you feel might be significant in forwarding Korean studies, uh, please let uh, us know. Uh, I don't want to confess too much, but Professor Beck is also on the organ is also on the board of directors of this particular uh, foundation. We initially were one of the uh, co-sponsors for the event that was scheduled in in the spring, and uh, I appreciate uh, Dr. Beck letting uh, letting us uh, join this illustrious group here at this this particular time. Um, in the search for peace on Korea. It can somewhat, sometimes seem somewhat elusive, um, but if we look to Korea's past, and I am a historian by trade, so you've got to excuse me for, for talking about history, but history is important in understanding where we are today. Then if we look at Korea's past, we can see the unification uh, and peace on the peninsula was the norm, the norm for well over a thousand years. I'm a student of the Cordial Kingdom. Uh, I, know, I know you all know the dates, 918 to 1392, um, but it, Cordial confronted a very similar dilemma uh, as it was in the process of being unified. Uh, the, dilemma, the dilemma was that Korea in, at the beginning of the 10th century, say in the year 900, was divided into three sections that were they're often warring with each other. And over the course of uh, four decades, uh, very gradually, a, a peace was engineered. And uh, the, the opponents uh, gradually found ways to come together and work. And particularly in this, this competition back in the 10th century, the Cordial's founder, Wang Daegun, and uh, Shilla's last king, Kyung Sung Wang, both play a very, very important role in bringing a long lasting peace in the fact that they were very magnanimous with each other. They're very willing to compromise with each other. They're very willing to support each other. So finally, in 936, uh, King Kyungsung made a procession all the way from Kyungju up to Gaegyeong, Kaesong, and uh, thereby gave his kingdom to, to Koryo. And it was a very magnanimous uh, gesture on both, both, both monarchs' parts. But what they did by, through this act was ensure a lasting peace in Cordio and a lasting peace, a lasting unification of Korea that lasted well up until uh, uh, 1945. And so you can see um, by, by searching for an amicable solution, they were able to reunify the peninsula and that continued for over for nearly uh, 10, a thousand years. So I think as we look to Korea's past, we can see it as a model for the future. And I, I, I certainly believe uh, a lasting peace can return to the peninsula with good, good conscience, good work, and good diplomacy. Anyway, I look forward to the discussion today. I think you have some, some very fine speakers uh, uh, topped off with uh, Moon Jung-in at the end. So, I'll study a lot. Thank you so much, Professor Schultz, for your wonderful uh, welcome remark. I'm also ready to learn uh, from uh, today's uh, very, very excellent uh, participants, speakers, and also keynote speaker today. Currently, we have around uh, uh, 50 some uh, participants uh, as uh, attendees. And unfortunately, in this webinar, we are not showing the faces of the participants. However, uh, uh, everybody uh, seems to be uh, very, very, uh, you know, excited. And at the later stage after the event, I uh, may open up uh, the all uh, participants in this uh, setting as a gallery view participants so that we can at least have a chance to see each other. And in the meantime, during this pa uh, panel session that will be beginning shortly, uh, we will ask uh, the, all of the participants as well as the uh, attendee and panelists uh, submit your Q&A question and, uh, and other comments uh, by sending either an uh, email to kscore at hawaii.edu. 
as you see from the slide that I'm just showing, or you may use the Q&A feature that is available down at the bottom of the, this page. If you uh, submit your Q&A uh, through email or this link, I will summarize it and then we'll uh, ask the panelists to uh, respond to those questions. Without further ado, I would like to move ahead to our uh, next uh, program, uh, which is a panel discussion titled Korean War and the Road to Peace on Korean Peninsula. Today's uh, speaker, as you see here, are, uh, consists of four uh, excellent uh, experts. And uh, Dr. Jenny Chin is from Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency. And she is very famous uh, because she had visited North Korea already several times and uh, had worked on this issue for a long time. So this is very exciting opportunity for us to learn what is going on in Hawaii uh, with regard to the, the dealing with the aftermath of Korean War. And also our colleague, Professor C. Chi Hung Harrison Kim, uh, who is from history department of the University of Hawaii Manoa, will also speak on North Korea and the legacy of the Korean War. Dr. Song Min Cho, who is a professor at uh, uh, Daniel K. Inoue Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, will speak on China's perspectives of the Korean unification. And uh, our last but not the least uh, presenta presenter speaker will be uh, Mrs. Christine Ahn, who is a secretary general and founder of the Women Cross DMG. Uh, and uh, she will talk with the title of Peace and Unification and the Women's Role. So without further ado, I will uh, ask Dr. Jean to begin her presentation. Go ahead, please, Dr. Jean. Okay. This is really um, making me nervous. I've never done a webinar. <laughs> I've never presented anything and it's really um, um, interesting, but hello everyone. So I will talk about the politics of bones in, in a more international relations um, perspective. Is it, or can it be a soft power tool? So just to just to make clarify, uh, I am a forensic anthropologist working for the defense um, POW MI accounting agency, but this talk is solely based on my opinion. Okay. How do I go to, oh, there we go. So you will probably, all of you will remember this historic time. Um, I still remember where I was watching this with who. Um, and I was really surprised. It was like um, pretty much late at night in Hawaii. And all of a sudden President Trump lifted the uh, agreement and showed it to the media and they, they took a picture. So, you know, I didn't think much of it. And then like 10 minutes later, I was like, maybe I should take a look at what they agreed on. And then it's in the right, uh, the blue box to the right. And then number four was about remains repatriation. So I was like, what? <laughs> So I knew this was coming, uh, kind of, but not. I didn't know this would end up um, on the agreement because I was getting a lot of um, phone calls that morning prior to uh, the summit asking for all different information about the Korean War remains that we have in the laboratory. Um, just to put, give you a perspective, the US casualties uh, during the Korean War was about uh, 36,000 um, of those, still 7,500 US service members are missing from the Korean Peninsula. And of those about 5,000 are believed to be somewhere in North Korea. But so when we look at the Trump and Kim summit, would you guys say that was a success? And that's something, it depends on how you see it, right? Because the first three agendas are the big, big agendas. Um, like nuclear um, 
a weapon and like peace. So, but number four was to, to a lot of people, it's just nothing. They just put it in there uh, because Americans can be very emotional and they react to this kind of stuff. That's how some people see it. The way I see it is different. It, this, to me, it was a very meaningful um, um, summit because I was directly involved with number four item. So to, to put this in a different perspective, like then why did this happen? So that's when we can look at what happened previously. And that's why I um, gave my presentation the name, The Politics of Bones, because human remains can be very, very personal Right, I see a lot of family members coming to our laboratory to look at the remains of their loved ones. They have never met like, oh, this is my grandfather. I've never met my grandfather. So it can be really personal. That's the first time for the grandson to actually meet his grandfather in front of me um, as a skeleton. Um, but at the same time, when you think about it, it's very political um, because the political um, political context has to support this mission wherever we recover without the political support, um, such recovery may not be possible. So from that perspective, it's, it's a little bit of both. Um, and they are on the other extreme, very private, very personal to very political. So put it in that context and US Vietnam was, this is what actually triggered the whole mission. Um, to the point that to, to the existence of DPAA at the current form. So it started at the end of Vietnam War. It was mostly driven by the Vietnam War families um, insisting the US government should continue with the search and recovery. And of course that alone have not contributed, uh, that alone didn't make the, the normalization happen between the US and Vietnam, but it was actually a very big and important tool the Clinton administration used um, to, to engage Vietnam back into this discussion. Because again, a lot of people get very emotional. South Korea and China have been um, ex not exchanging. South Korea has been sending hundreds of Chinese um, service members back to China. And this year was the largest repatriation. So again, this can be very personal and I'm not by any means saying this makes the repatriation any less meaningful. Um, it is still a very important uh, mission yet we cannot detach it from the political context. So South Korea and China have been doing this for over um, six years now. And there was a, a very large, the largest scale, um, one of the largest scales repatriation happened a few, a month ago um, to China, which is really interesting in itself because Chinese government was emphasizing the close tie with South Korea and how they came a long way since the Korean War, yet the United States is not acting um, properly to build peace. So there was a message attached to this repatriation of human remains. US and North Korea, Trump Kim summit was not the first time um, to deal with the, uh, the repatriation of missing US service members from the Korean War. It was the North Korea, um, North Koreans repatriated a lot of hundreds of remains since the early 90s back to the United States. And what was their motive? I don't know. Um, but we have so far identified over 500 individuals from these uh, remains that we received from North Korea. And we went into North Korea to conduct our own recovery mission from 1996 to 2005. We were actively engaging the North Koreans right after the Kim, um, Trump and Kim summit um, to go back to North Korea to continue with our excavation um, but the North Koreans uh, never responded to us. But so that of the four items that was on the agreement between Trump and Kim um, summit, the only tangible thing I, I 
the, the only tangible thing I would say was the, the return of the 55 boxes from North Korea. And I just wanna share um, slides with you. That was, I took that photo uh, of the beautiful C-17 bird um, at Osan Air Base in Korea. That was at 4.30 in the morning and everything was very carefully um, choreographed down to the second. And we flew um, into Wonsan, flew all the way out to the east, and then flew back into Wonsan. And the map to the right, uh, one of our linguists who went with us, he pulled out his phone and then turned it on. And then you can see how we, it located, located us in Wonsan. So I thought that was really neat. So we went in there. Um, the North Koreans, I was involved in the actual negotiation with the North Koreans, which was in and of itself very interesting, uh, especially to, to me as a Korean American and also as an anthropologist, it was really interesting. This time, the North Koreans were very, very friendly. Uh, they treated us so well and they invited us to the airport in Wonsan, Kalma um, Airport. And that's where they laid out all those 55 boxes of remains. And then we um, came back and um, be, we were escorted by six F-22s uh, the moment we crossed um, into South Korea airspace. So that was, that was pretty neat. And that aircraft uh, was, you can see it's Hikam Hawaii HH, um, the tail number. So that was all like very symbolic. It's like a lot of things that we do in the military, it's very symbolic, but it has a meanings to it. So we, we send our aircraft from Hawaii and of these remains, so in 55 boxes in North Korea, the North Korean anthropologists actually told me um, they were very nice to me, especially when they figured that I, I am a native Korean speaker. So they were asking me all like different questions, which was really nice. I felt very, very, um, I, I don't know how to describe, like it, it was really strange feeling. Um, to just be able to talk to them about like, oh, are you married? You know, that all kind of Korean questions. How old are you? Are you married? Is your husband Korean? Do you speak Korean at home? What do you eat? Um, Korean food, American food, that kind of stuff. Like it was very personal, actually. There was no host hostility. And it was really sad to just, you know, leave it, leave the town and think like, wow, I cannot really go back there. But we brought back 55 boxes of remains and the anthropologist told me they did their best to segregate them into discrete individuals, but there is always a potential of remains being commingled. So meaning they had the remains somewhere and they built 55 boxes for us um, by putting the bones together and making them look like one person. Um, so we brought them back and as we expected, there were a lot of South Korean soldiers um, remains mixed in the boxes, let alone Americans. So of the 55 boxes, we believe 250 individuals were present. And of those, uh, about 150 are believed to be US and the rest we think are South Koreans. And we identified 69 US service members from the 55 boxes we brought back in 2018. And we repatriated 77 um, individuals from that particular 55 boxes back to South Korea this June um, at their 70th anniversary. So this was the largest scale repatriation. Um, and the Korean government already identified seven of them that we sent to, to Korea. And one of the grandsons um, who they identified, he sent me a personal message say, um, telling me how much it actually meant to him when, and him and his family, when they had no idea where exactly his grandfather went and how he went missing. Because we all know it was pretty chaotic and rec record keeping was, was not really a thing um, back then. We just couldn't afford to, to deal with that, we meaning Korea. So it was very, very touching. You know, I've been doing this for 10 years and I'm pretty um, dry person, not very emotional, but that message was really touching and like, wow, I'm actually involved and I am uh, part of the, the journey that can mean so much to, to these surviving people. 
So uh, in September um, 19th in Korea in 2018, South Korea and North Korea agreed on all different types of uh, all different issues that, uh, regarding military. And one of the agreements was that they will do a joint recovery at the DMZ, um, starting at the Arrowhead Hill. Unfortunately, North Koreans never responded. So the South Korean government already cleared and they have done the excavation for a long time. And the remains they found from that hill, they already sent a lot of them back to China because they happened to, they turned out to be the Chinese um, remains. So that all sounded like, okay, maybe this is a great tool, great tool to engage. It may not be the biggest tool. It may not be the most important tool, not very convincing. Some people may think like, what, why do you have to deal with all these dead people? But just, just think about it slightly different way. Um, it can be very powerful. And who knows this the best? I believe Kim Jong-un knows this the best because um, I don't know if any of you recognizes uh, where this is, but this is for a very recent photo, October um, 2020. Kim Jong-un went for the third time to, to pay uh, respect um, at uh, Chairman Mao's oldest son's grave which is still in North Korea um, because he was killed during the Korean War. So while we're talking about peace treaty and everything, Kim Jong-un made a big move and showed up at um, Mao's son's grave and emphasized the blood alliance between North Korea and China. And he did the same thing in 2018, the same day that he returned the 55 US soldiers back to US he was at um, Mao's son's gravesite. So politics of bones, I think this actually sums it up really well. So how do we move forward? As an anthropologist, I don't have a big policy um, suggestions or recommendations. I look at, these are the guys that, uh, the picture on the far right, he's the one um, that we sent back from North, uh, Hawaii. He's, he was one of the 50, uh, 77 guys we repatriated to South Korea. So it's always like when you look at these people, they were all once living. Oftentimes everything breaks down into numbers, like how many million people died. But if you look at one and each of them, it's actually, it's a different story. It can be a very powerful story. So I believe this can be um, the politics of bones. I, I don't like the word itself because it makes it like, makes it less significant. Um, the sound of it, I don't like it, um, but I think you know what I mean. So just each and um, every individual is special. They have their own story. So I believe um, the human remains repatriation um, mission can be a great tool to engage um, other party um, and then to pull them out into a dialogue. And that is all I have. Thank you very much, Dr. Jean, for your excellent presentation. And she uh, has more interesting uh, pictures, but uh, I think she uh, tried to not to show all of them for her later use, I think, or in other uh, <laughs> No, settings. you said I have 10 minutes, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but thank you so much. It's already you know very moving story and everybody knows what it, this is about. So our uh, next speaker, is uh, uh, Professor Chiyong Harrison Kim. And uh, the topic is North Korea and the legacy of Korean War. Dr. Kim, go ahead, please. Yes, hello. Um, thank you very much, Professor Peck, for um, this wonderful occasion. And it's great to be part of this uh, wonderful um, panel uh, with um, experts, activists, um, and especially it's an honor to be with um, the specialist um, advisor, um, Moon. Um, I, I thought he was uh, coming to Hawaii, but I guess he's just uh, joining us via a camera. I guess. Uh, yeah, he wanted to come until yes. the last moment, but because of pandemic, unfortunately, I know. this time. Yes, Taewong and I originally had a, a big plan for this um, conference, uh, and uh, we're but you know this is still fantastic. So, so my um, my small objective 
here is to talk about the Korean War, uh, how it impacted North Korea, but on a uh, more of a global scale, how um, we can see North Korea, what happened to North Korea after the Korean War, and it, what it tells us about our world history or global history in general. So a civil war after colonialism is the rule, not the exception, all over the world. This happens everywhere in every single region, colonial period and, and the beginning of a post-colonial period is, is almost always met by civil wars. And of course, this is also what happened um, on the Korean Peninsula. And then it is followed by a severe authoritarian turn. Um, and of course, um, this accelerated in North Korea and uh, this also happened in South Korea. Um, and we also see a very parallel story um, emerging in the post-war period in North Korea and South Korea. But, um, but um, let's take a look at North Korea from a more mac uh, micro perspective. Um, the Korean War transformed North Korea into what historians and uh, political scientists commonly call war communism. Um, and um, there were uh, many features of uh, this kind of context. I mean, we're talking about cultural impact. We're talking about linguistic impact. We're talking everything from dress codes to military structure to uh, leisure time and so forth. The Korean War looms large over North Korea as it once did over South Korea too. But, um, but to be more specific, um, the war really changed how people lived and worked in their daily life. So um, the, the war became the most important cause that led to the suspension of many workers' rights and North Korea right until then had very progressive radical workers' rights and many of these became suspended. For, um, and, and if we look at, for example, cabinet decision number 33 that, that was passed in 1952, what we see is the beginnings of linking um, militarism and military culture with education. And this is a, a clear sign of a post-war nation state building, but at the same time, it is also a, um, a serious sign of an authoritarian turn when students become basically young soldiers in training. And uh, um, those of you guys are here know that this also happened in South Korea too. Um, there's a wonderful photo, amazing photo of uh, middle school girls, uh, girls uh, right after the Korean War, coming back to their school grounds and rebuilding their school together. And of course, this creates, created a tremendous sense of unity, but at the same time, um, uh, a uh, um, unity that was uh, framed by this uh, extreme sense of, of um, um, nationalism, of course. Um, so, so another, a, a few, a set of characteristics that define this point. We see an acceleration of party control within the working environment. So uh, this can be also termed as a tremendous politicization of the everyday working environment. Um, in here, we see the beginnings of mandatory unpaid work. We also see a more severe attribution of productivity and nationalism. And in, uh, in a more serious manner, um, the start of control of trade unions by the party. And uh, we know very well today that um, the trade un unions, one hallmark of a true democratic un trade union is that it is an independent organ from the government. Um, and uh, this was slowly fading away in North Korea in the 1950s. Let me move on um, um, more quickly. One, uh, one very interesting aspect uh, that we see from the 50s and 60s and on is this intense militarism of everyday life. And this involves a kind of a new language of danger, threat, 
but also soldiering that is involved in living and working. Um, here's a poster here, and it says, in the spirit of revolutionary soldiers, uh, that we, uh, it's a poster about mining, mining coal, for example. Um, and another way of thinking about this is the beginning of the practice of exceptionalism into law, education, and of course, in memory formation. Um, here's some, some, some crucial laws that were passed, but basically by the end of the 1950s, uh, many of the progressive labor human rights, yes, even human rights laws that, had, that, that were passed in North Korea, many of them were cur curtailed, or many, many of them were given uh, separate additional laws that can um, um, change or make these laws more flexible. Um, one interesting aspect here is that the Korean War also empowered a whole group of, of the North Korean population, and, um, and that's women. So casualties in labor drain really called for young women, especially young women, to take control of idling machines. They were called from the rural areas, from the countryside, from, from the cooperative farms, and put into factories, in, in intense factories, heavy machinery factories, in mines, and so forth. Of course, women did participate in battle, too. So we have the famous case of Han Sunya, who is considered a hero today. She killed five American soldiers and obtained their plans. So women did participate in battle. But um, what was more important is that, that, that young women were called upon to become new industrial workers. And in fact, to produce more than the men. Um, and what is also uh, highly interesting and problematic is that the Federation of Women's Organization, the most important national organization that exists even today, participated in the mobilization effort. Um, so what, what all this to me uh, really is about, and uh, the important thing is that the war created a national condition of the exceptional state. And the exceptional state can be simplistically seen as authoritarianism, um, some, some, some really harshly critical people even call it a, a paranoia state and so forth. But to me, what is really important is, is recognizing how politics appears as the priority in all sectors of life. We're talking about extra legal situations of politics where law and rights become flexible. And what is revealed is a political space beyond the juridical order. So uh, the exceptional state is really a political space sanctioned by law. What is interesting about this political exceptional space, it is that it is highly indeterminate. It is an indeterminate space filled with ideology, nationalism, and other abstract ideas. At the same time, the exceptional state of politics is a space of possibilities. Um, so, so this also happened in South Korea, in a very authoritarian, harsh, difficult space of exceptionalism in South Korea, we also see a massive opening of a political space of resistance, especially by the younger generation. And a similar approach can be taken with North Korea too. Yes, a space of rule and order, but also an opening up of a political space as immense possibilities. So, um, so this is a global story at the same time. What we see in North Korea it appears exceptional and unique and bizarre, but those things are only at the surface level. And at the more uh, serious level, we see a global story, um, a condition that appears in all regions where the, the post-war context creates a massive um, uh, situation of political possibility. And, and to me, this is um, a sign of openness and hope as well.
uh, that there are legal boundaries, of course, but then we are supposed to overcome certain legal boundaries toward a greater political possibilities. And I think uh, we are headed toward that direction today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Harrison. Very, very uh, interesting and uh, also thought provoking uh, points that, that you raised, which I'm sure uh, we will uh, follow up uh, with uh, more discussions later. And in the meantime, I would like to remind all of the panelists and also attendees uh, to use the Q&A uh, window. And also uh, you may uh, even type on the chat uh, function as well. And I just changed the setting so that all of the uh, questions will be appearing uh, without waiting uh, the previous ones are answered. So uh, I really hope to uh, see uh, library uh, questions and later uh, answers uh, to those questions. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Song Min Cho. And, uh, he is actually uh, uh, has written a paper, in fact, for this uh, event. I would say virtually because uh, he was uh, actually uh, one of the speakers uh, to be. Pre uh, we were expecting to present in April uh, before this event was postponed, and I'm very very excited that he could join at this event. Uh, Professor uh, Cho is from Daniel Inoue. Uh, Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, and the title of presentation is China's Perspectives of the Korean Unification. Dr. Zhou, please. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Beck. Let me share my screen. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Um, Hello, my name is Song Min Cho, and I'm a professor of uh, Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. So for the next 10 to 12 minutes, based upon my two years of research on Chinese foreign policy, I'll be speaking about the Chinese perspectives of the Korean unification. But before I begin, uh, as a faculty member of the U.S. Depart Department of Defense Institute, I have to say that the views expressed in this presentation only represents uh, my personal views and are not the views of the US Department of Defense. So here is the structure of my presentation. First, I will address the problems of bias and exaggeration in the Western analysis of the Chinese perspective. And second, I will explain why it is useful to analyze the Chinese text on the Korean unification. Third, I will report what I found from reading Chinese publications written by Chinese scholars in Chinese. Lastly, based upon the findings and analysis, I will make three arguments that I'd like to share with you. So from Deng Xiaoping to Xi Jinping, Chinese leaders have consistently stressed that China will support Korean unification as long as its process is peaceful and independent without foreign intervention. So what they mean by peaceful is without war or military conflict on the Korean Peninsula. This implies that China may intervene in the process of Korean unification if it turns violent. By independent, they mean that the process should be handled by Korean people only, and China will not allow a unified Korea to stay pro-United States. If the USFK stays, China will oppose and intervene in the unification process. Uh, but does this mean that China will enter and dominate the North Korea or China will do anything to stop the Korean unification if USFK continues to stay? Or does this mean that China is ready for another Korean war? So faced with a lot of great uncertainty, there is a psychological tendency to believe that China has a secret plan to prepare for war with the USFK or keep the Korean Peninsula uh, divided. So this is a popular image when you Google Chinese views of the Korean unification. I trace back the origin of this image. It was first claimed by a Japanese scholar who guessed that this is what China might do if the Korean unification is likely to happen. 
And people keep talking about that and that it, it is accepted as a factual information. But the truth is that we just don't know if Beijing really has such a plan or not. And it might be just exaggeration of Beijing's intent from a person's biased understanding of the Chinese views. So for a more balanced analysis, I suggest that we should first read extensively what Chinese scholars have actually written and said about the Korean unification in Chinese internally. So what I did was that I used the Chinese national knowledge infrastructure to collect scholarly articles that include, that include Korean Peninsula and unification in the titles. The search engine returned 62 journal articles written by Chinese scholars in Chinese. I also used the Baidu.com to collect a sample of 29 expert commentaries or essays on the Korean unification. Of course, you can raise questions about the value of Chinese scholarly writings because of the strong censorship in China. Ironically, however, the censorship also implies that we can gauge to what extent Chinese analysts are allowed to publish their opinions. So let's say the true spectrum of the Chinese Communist Party's internal discussion is like this. One has one extreme idea, such as China will accept and live with pro-America uh, unified Korea. Let's say 10 represents another extreme idea that China will fight another Korean war to repel the USFK from unified Korea. Uh, Chinese scholars may not be able to publish such extreme ideas, even if the party officials discuss such policies inside. What we do know for sure is that the ideas that Chinese scholars are allowed to publish are within the boundary of the Communist Party's internal discussion. So in this sense, the Chinese academic publications can still serve as a window to look into how Chinese policymakers think about the issue more broadly. So in my research paper, I present the summaries of the Chinese views on the potential cost and benefit and China's strategic approaches in the event of the Korean unification. Then I address several issues that have a perceptional gap between inside and outside China. For example, number one, whether North Korea is still considered as a buffer zone in China. Number two, whether North, North Korea problem is China's diplomatic card or not. Number three, how much Chinese are actually worried about the refugee crisis. Number four, how the Korean unification may impact China's domestic, domestic politics and so on. Unfortunately, due to the time limit, I cannot go over all the details, but if you're interested, you can read my article to be published at, with Korea Observer in December. But let me focus on the single biggest concern for China when it comes to Korea unification, which is the future status of the US forces Korea in a unified Korea. So first of all, we can assume that American public opinion will be divided. Many Americans would want to see uh, they would want to bring back their sons and daughters once North Korea is gone. On the other hand, some Americans would claim that USFK should stay to maintain balance of power in Northeast Asia. Korean public opinion can be divided too. The conservative would likely claim USFK should stay, but the progressive politicians may want to see the USFK leave Korean Peninsula. So depending on the combination, there can be four outcomes. If both countries want to see withdrawal of the USFK, they will be an immediate leap. If, they will, uh, if uh, one country wants to stay, uh, the, want to see the USFK to stay, then there will be a negotiation uh, which will lead to phase the leap. If both countries want to have USFK in a unified Korea, then there will be a long-term stay. Um, China's preferred outcome can be also ranked from the most desirable to the least desirable, as you can see in the table from top down. First, China would surely welcome the immediate leave of USFK. Secondly, the US wants to, if the US wants to leave a uh, unified Korea, wants the USFK to stay, it will not be very hard for Beijing to make a deal with Washington. Since Beijing and Washington share a common policy orientation, it will, it will not be difficult for them to ignore uh, Korea's policy demand. But how is China likely to react to scenario three and four? 
Would Beijing unilaterally intervene in the Korean affairs? Would Beijing try to annex North Korea or establish puppet, puppet regime in Pyongyang instead of supporting unification process? Maybe or maybe not. But it is too risky for us to jump to such conclusion if we want to effectively negotiate with Beijing. So within the party, it is possible that there can be two extreme ideas at the end of the full spectrum. On the one extreme end, China would just accept Korea with USFK as a reality. On the other extreme end, China would fight another Korean war to repel the USFK. These two extreme ideas are still too provocative to pass the censorship. And actually, even we are not sure if such ideas have ever been discussed within the party. Instead, it is certain that if I can read, if Chinese could publish after censorship, such ideas have been, have been certainly considered within the party. And this is what I read from the Chinese publications. Even if USFK stays in a unified Korea, Chinese scholars think that its missions are going to change. Chinese experts expect that bilateral alliance between US and Korea can evolve into multilateral institution at the regional level. Then the function of USFK will change from defense of South Korea to a peacekeeping operation under the framework of multilateral security architecture in Northeast Asia. In this context, the Korean unification can contribute to the stability of Northeast Asia, which also serves China's national interest. So under the UN peacekeeping operations or regional security architecture, PLA and USFK may find some opportunities to work together for the common goal of security, securing WMD sites or for the stable management of unification process or for the non-combat missions such as providing humanitarian support. I'm not arguing that China only has such a friendly plan to cooperate with the US. I'm not arguing we should trust China. But what is important is that in order to develop a strategy to effectively engage China, we should understand the broad range of Beijing's cost-benefit calculus and use them back during the negotiation with Beijing rather than fixating our assumption on the, ex on the extreme ideas. So let me summarize my, my arguments into three points. First, there is a greater room for policy, flexibility, and negotiation with Beijing concerning Korean affairs compared to other regions such as Taiwan or South China Sea. So for my explanation of why Beijing would rather cooperate with Washington than fight another Korean war, you can see my article published in the Security Nexus. Second, analyzing Chinese experts' writing is useful to infer a broader and longer-term Chinese perspective. Again, for the full account of what I found from reading 62 Chinese journal articles and 29 media commentaries, you can see my upcoming article at Korea Observer. Third, Chinese scholars openly discuss Kim, the Kim Jong-un regime's inability to conduct the Chinese-style reform and opening internally, which implies that the Chinese experts know so well that if, if unification ever happens on the Korean Peninsula, it will be led by South Korea, not the North. So with this shameless self-promotion, let me start my presentation here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Jo. Very interesting uh, presentation based upon your personal research. Great. Our uh, next speaker will be uh, Ms. Christine On, Secretary General and the founder of a uh, Women Cross DMZ. Uh, the title of the presentation is Peace and Unification and Women's Role. Thank you so much for having me and uh, aloha to everybody that is joining this uh, wonderful and very interesting conference and panel. Um, I think I will start with a video that kind of um, is a trailer. It's a short trailer of a forthcoming documentary by Deanne Borchelim about the global movement that Women Cross CMZ is a part of. So uh, without further ado, I think I'll start with that and then I will give a, a brief presentation about 
the um, the work that women are doing all around the world. So um, share the screen and okay, let me just do full screen here. And here we go. As a daughter of South Korean immigrants, I grew up being told stories about her homeland. This is Korea, a nation divided at the end of World War II at the 38th parallel. These stories made us fear North Korea. And it was something that I never questioned until much later. More than 60 years after the ceasefire, North and South Korea and the U.S. are still technically at war. I decided I needed to meet the people that were supposed to be my enemy. And that's when I started to understand the legacy of a war that never ended. Breaking now in North Korea, women from around the world are preparing to make a demonstration for peace. A prominent women's activist group is planning a symbolic and controversial walk across the demilitarized zone. Women are disproportionately impacted by war and violence. And it's time to have a seat at the table. Peace. A lot of people say it was naive and you cannot do this. Several hundred people are here to counter protest against us. Anyone who calls on engagement with North Korea, they've been maligned. If there's not agreement between the two militaries, the government does not feel that our safety would be assured. What are we doing that is so threatening? People think that the only way North Korea can be dealt with is to eliminate it. There is an image that there aren't real people and that they must be destroyed. This artificial boundary has kept Korean people separated. Okay, let me see here. Okay, um, let's close this. Um, Would you please unmute? Yes. Uh, can you hear me now? Let's see. Can you hear me now, Professor Beck? Yes. Okay. Yes, we hear you clearly. Okay, great. So um, here we go again. I'm going to start sharing my presentation. Um, let me do the full view here. Um, oops. Okay, full screen on. Okay, so um, today I'm going to speak to you. Thank you so much, Professor Beck, and all my fellow panelists for a very interesting conversation. I look forward to further um, discussing so many of the other interesting presentations. But I'm, I'm here to share the work of women's movements to end the Korean War. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about Women Cross DMZ and the work of our campaign partners that are part of the transnational feminist campaign, Korea Peace Now. As many of you know, five years ago, Women Cross DMZ made, made headlines when we brought together 30 women peace builders from around the world, including Nobel Peace Laureates, Mairead McGuire and uh, Lima Gaboe from Liberia and American feminist icon, Gloria Steinem, to cross the DMZ. We also held peace symposiums in Pyongyang and in Seoul, where we heard North and South Korean women talk about how the Korean War impacted their lives. And we walked with 10,000 women on both sides of the border. We walked in Pyongyang, in Kaesong, and then we crossed into Paju. With this act, we called for a formal end to the Korean War with a peace agreement, and the reunion of separated families and women's involvement in the peace process. Since our crossing, our calls for peace have become louder and more urgent, especially after 2017, when the US and North Korea came dangerously close to another war. But I wanna share with you five ways that women have been laying the foundation for peace. 
Number one, we've brought women together across boundaries. The initial goal of our 2015 crossing was for women from North and South Korea and around the world to cross the DMZ together in a symbolic act. Well, unfortunately, we were not able to do so, but we never stopped trying to bring women together, the North and South Korean women, because we know that uh, when we're together, we're stronger, but it's also Korean women from North and South. So in February, 2016, Women Cross DMZ, we tried to bring North and South Korean women together in Indonesia. It's one of a handful of countries where both women can meet. We succeeded in bringing six women from the DPRK. They ranged in age from 20 to their 60s, and many had participated in the Women's Peace Symposium in Pyongyang. Many of these women had never left North Korea before, and so you can imagine how much uh, my heart warmed seeing them at the airport. Unfortunately, as retribution for North Korea testing a nuclear weapon, the then president, Park Geun-hye, uh, basically you know, denied and made it illegal for the South Korean women to join us for a um, North-South international meeting. And so, um, and given the intense red baiting that they had endured for organizing the 2015 crossing, the South Korean women were, did not, um, you know, were not able to meet. And so we just held back-to-back -back meetings. So after multiple attempts, after finally in 2018 in Beijing, we brought North and South Korean women together with women from China, Japan, Russia, the US and Canada for the first ever Northeast Asia Women, Peace and Security Roundtable. We faced enormous challenges given the politically fraught tensions between the US, Canada and China over the Huawei dis dispute. But thankfully we were able to meet in the Canadian embassy. We talked, we laughed, we shared meals, and we discussed how we can achieve a more peaceful future with women at the peacemaking table. In fact, at that meeting, Jackie O'Neill, who has since become the first Women, Peace and Security Ambassador of Canada, presented several examples of how women's peace groups inserted themselves at the peacemaking table in different conflicts around the world. So that's one. Number two, we launched the global campaign Korea Peace Now. In 2019, Women Cross CMZ with the Nobel Women's Initiative, the Korean Women's Movement for Peace, which includes four long-standing South Korean women's peace organizations, and WILP. It's the oldest women's peace organization. We came together to launch this campaign. Thanks to a $2 million grant from the Novo Foundation's Radical Hope Fund, we launched that spring in four cities in DC, New York, Ottawa, and Seoul. And now we actually had the means to bring women from all around the globe to strategize and work together toward our shared goals of ending the war with a peace agreement and ensuring women's leadership in the peace process. Um, in this picture, there are several members of the South Korean National Assembly, and uh, they also came. Here's Jackie O'Neill, the Women, Peace and Security Ambassador, and this is a former ambassador um, during the Obama administration, Bonnie Jenkins. Number three, we highlighted the impact that sanctions have on North Korean people. Unfortunately, despite the US and North Korea committing to a new relationship at the 2018 Singapore summit, the Trump administration had maintained a policy of maximum pressure, crippling sanctions and the threat of military action to compel North Korea to abandon its nuclear weapons. Well, not only have sanctions not succeeded, they have severely harmed North Korean people's lives. To highlight the violence imposed by sanctions, we commissioned this report, the human costs and gendered impact of sanctions on North Korea. It's multidisciplinary, humanitarian workers, scholars, legal experts. And we felt the moment was ripe to push back against the Trump administration and the UN Security Council on sanctions, especially since they have been such a key obstacle to advancing the peace process. We released this report in New York and in, in Geneva at the UN. We held many closed door meetings with various missions. We held high profile events such as at the Council on Foreign Relations. We held editorial meetings at the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And you can see the Wall Street Journal they were the one that ultimately broke the story, but we got major coverage in the USA Today, Forbes magazine, The Hill. Um, it stimulated many conversations. 
uh, among you know, policy circles and the UN panel of experts. Well, after sending the report to Thomas Quintana, the UN Special Rapporteur on North Korea Human Rights, he urged governments to hear our message and he called for the easing of sanctions during the pandemic. And most importantly, he noted the importance of peace in improving human rights. We have also engaged senior officials from all sides, the Deputy National Security Advisor, Matthew Pottinger, Deputy Secretary of State, Stephen Began, President Moon, Senior Advisor, Moon chung in and uh, the DPRK Permanent Mission to the UN and also the National Peace Committee. The picture on the far right is myself and Liz Bernstein of the Nobel Women's Initiative. We traveled to Cambodia last December to meet with Mr. Oryong Yil of the National Peace Committee. We believe it's just so important to be engaging with all sides and encouraging them to end the Korean War. But a key part of our work has been building a national grassroots network. We believe it's important to build the political space for peace and to amplify the voices from the grassroots. And so we have an extraordinary team led by Hyun Lee and Echo Cho, um, and they are uh, so successful in organizing 10 uh, regional grassroots networks, including one here in Hawaii. Our members are, oops, let's see. Our members are uh, multi-generational Korean Americans. They're peace activists, veterans, students, housewives, small business owners, academics, and others who, collect, who collectively press for an end to the Korean War. They collect signatures on postcards, organize house meetings, call and meet with their representatives. They show up at town halls, write letters to the editors. They tell their personal stories to representatives. This is truly a people powered movement led and mobilized by women. So in June, we organized a national advocacy week with over 200 members conducting over 90 virtual lobby visits with congressional staffers. In fact, professors uh, Beck, Schultz and Harrison were among those who participate in these meetings with our representatives. And as a result, we secured um, no more members of Congress to support many resolutions from uh, barring President Trump from waging an unauthorized war against North Korea and supporting the reunion of divided families. But lastly, we're building Korea peace champions. Our main legislative vehicle for building the political will for a peace agreement is House Resolution 152 calls for an end to the Korean War and a peace agreement. And we worked with Congressman Ro Khanna to provide substantial input to this resolution. Although it goes against over 30 years of uh, Washington orthodoxy, it now has 52 co-sponsors, including all the contenders of the next House Foreign Affairs Committee chair and the first Republican, Andy Biggs from Arizona. Compare this to a decade ago on the 60th anniversary of the Korean War, when only two members of Congress would support peace with North Korea. So we're now working with Rep Khanna and a national coalition of groups to introduce a new bipartisan resolution in the 2021 Congress, including a Senate version. Although we still have a long way to go, there is growing bipartisan consensus for peace. Uh, according to a poll released uh, last year by the Data for Progress and YouGov, 67% of American voters support negotiating a peace agreement with North Korea and highest is among Republicans at 76%. We're also seeing growing support for reducing the military budget. And most Americans think that the US should negotiate with adversaries to prevent war. We're also seeing the election as we saw of more diverse forces calling for a new US foreign policy away from endless wars. These are all steps in the right direction but history tells us there is one element that can improve the outcome of a peace process. And that is the involvement of civil society, especially women's groups. Research shows that when women are involved in peace processes, an agreement is more likely to be reached and to last. Between 1991 and 2017, women's groups were involved in 71% of informal peace processes. I can confidently say that our participation helps legitimize the formal peace process among the public. So we need women, we need members of Congress, we need the public and all of you working with us to finally bring an end to this 70 year conflict. Our work is far from over. 
As someone whose family was one of the countless Korean families impacted by the war, I believe that we must see an end to this war in our lifetimes. And with women leading the way, I believe it can be done. So thank you for allowing me to share some of our extraordinary work. Thank you very much. Go women, go. Yeah. So uh, with these four presentations, uh, I think we may have a little bit of uh, time to have some uh, Q&A. Uh, at this time, uh, Dr. Jong In Moon, Moon Jong In is also here joining and uh, uh, I will uh, call those uh, uh, participant panelists back to this uh, discussion sessions. So, so far uh, we have received this very small uh, amount of uh, uh, response. So I would like to ask first, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Jean and Harrison uh, to seek your uh, response. As you know, uh, all the discussion with uh, North Korea uh, between the US and North Korea happened in uh, Donald Trump's presidency. And now we will have a new uh, president, I think. Will it be continuing? That's uh, for Dr. Jin and for Professor Edison Kim. What do you see in terms of changes in culture in North Korea these days? And uh, what do you think people in North Korea, especially uh, you, the youth, uh, feel about Korean war? Go, oh, Harrison. Oh, no, Jenny, please, you can, please. Oh. <laughs> please, please, I, please. I, I have not much to add to the question <laughs> um, because we have enough remains um, to, to work on in the laboratory, especially because we started exhuming all 652 um, unknown graves at the punch bowl um, cemetery here in Hawaii from the Korean War. Um, so that will happen in the next seven years. Uh, we just finished phase two, so we still have 400 more graves to go. Um, so we have um, enough work to do. Will there be a recovery mission in Korea? I hope so. Um, but as I mentioned before, the North Koreans have never returned our proposals. Thanks. Um, thank you very much. So that's a highly relevant question. Um, you know, the North Koreans that I read about, that I've talked to during my visit, and someone like um, Christine An also can share her experience too, but they are very much more attuned to global politics than we are in their own way. They, they read their own presses, of course, and, and their, their presses certainly have their own angle of presenting the world, but they know the issues much better than South Korean counterparts. North Korean younger generation know about the world in a more detailed way than um, many other youths in so-called liberal democracy. I'm not saying that they're, they're better informed, but this is how, how their education is uh, largely done. So, um, I do see some significant changes. First of all, this kind of um, um, almost naive hate toward Americans, it's, it's going away. It's going away. So the old, the, my, even my generation, I believe, and our parents' generation, certainly, um, they carry this kind of casual, almost racist hatred toward American imperialism. Right, and, and it was not a deep-seated hate, but it was a casual kind of um, discrimination. I think that is slowly disappearing. I think North Korean youths, younger generation, they know that a different world has to come for them and that their world is already changing greatly. Um, they, are, they are liberalizing in both good and bad ways. Um, and uh, of course there are class disparities already happening in North Korea, but I think um, North Koreans are uh, very much well aware of what is happening and they clear have a, they have a clear sense of, of where they want to go. And, and that is, you know, some kind of a, a more engaged 
peaceful kind of world. That's for sure. Yeah, just to add a uh, short anecdote, you know what with the first question the North Korean soldier asked me in 2018 when we went to Wonsan? I'm not joking, but literally that was because but until then, like we just didn't really, we were just staring at each other. <laughs> and then when he realized I speak Korean, like he came to me, it's a North Korean Lieutenant Colonel came to me and said, um, are you guys safe from the uh, volcanic explosion? <laughs> because that's when the big island, um, ex you know, the lava and everything was in the news. And I was looking at him like, wow, <laughs> like, so that was pretty interesting how that was the first question that he asked me. Thank you very much. Uh, for Dr. Jo, uh, I'd like to ask whether uh, there, you have seen any changes in terms of China's perspective after 2013, before and after 2013, after Xi uh, regime started. And uh, uh, one of the participants, attendee, asked, uh, asked a question, Carol, uh, is the unification, uh, do you all foresee unification our future? You might also answer to that question in, uh, with regard to China. And uh, for Christine, uh, you have already responded to one of the questions that uh, the Nakir Song raised. So, uh, and my question to you as well is, uh, what would be, you know, the your view in terms of effectiveness of the work that you are doing, especially the end of world declaration? Do you what? What is your realistic assessment of the successfulness of it, and what is the usefulness of it? Yeah, so for your first question about uh, if there was a change in the Chinese perspective uh, of, uh, of North Korea since uh, Xi Jinping took power. So Xi Jinping became the leader of North uh, China in 2012. And until 2018, uh, Xi Jinping met with South Korean president um, six times. And then uh, Xi Jinping had never met with Kim Jong-un for the first six years. And it was only in 2018 that Xi Jinping first went, met with uh, and Kim Jong-un and they met uh, several times within that year. Uh, so that is a, a big contrast. So for, for the first six years, they never met. And then within one year, Xi Jinping and then uh, Kim Jong-un, they were eager to meet. Uh, that explains that the Xi Jinping was not very uh, happy with Kim Jong-un's um, Foreign policy or domestic politics, uh, we don't know. Uh, we don't know what's the what was the exactly the, the assessment within Beijing. Uh, there can be uh, we can make both arguments that there was a strategic patience on Beijing's part, or uh, or uh, Beijing was not really happy with uh, Kim Jong Un regime's uh, uh, too aggressive uh, uh, provocations, especially in 2017, which put Beijing. Into, the, into an unwanted position that it should worry about the real possibility of war, another military conflict on the Korean Peninsula. So in 2017, Xi Jinping was very tough to join the sanctions and pressure Pyongyang. And then the summit uh, started between uh, Washington and Pyongyang. And then at that point, uh, Xi Jinping wanted to get involved and had a close and deep communication with uh, Kim Jong-un, so there was a summit. So to, to your question, um, I think uh, Xi Jinping was uh, relatively uh, moving closer to South Korea for the, 60, for the first six years, uh, but later in 2018, uh, Xi Jinping is moving closer to uh, Pyongyang. And for the question about the uh, US and China foreign policy about uh, the Korean unification, what's the view? Uh, at least for China part, the hope is that China will follow uh, the footsteps of China, Deng Xiaoping, uh, and then Vietnam's case that uh, they both as a socialist country, they successfully uh, implemented economic reform and opening. Uh, it is ideal, uh, but when I read the uh, Chinese scholars articles uh, published internally, I was surprised to find that Chinese scholars, some of them are pessimistic. They know so well that North Korea cannot really uh, implement the Chinese style reform and open 
not because of external conditions like sanctions or uh, a threat from US versus Korea, but for the internal contradiction between economic reform and its uh, uh, destabilizing impact on the political system. So that's an interesting point from China. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I, I guess I have a few responses to your questions, Professor Beck. Um, the first is uh, we're not calling for an end of war declaration. We're actually calling for a peace agreement to end the Korean War. Um, the, the end of war declaration is, is really not sufficient. There needs to be a formal resolution to the war as promised with uh, the armistice agreement to return in 90 days to replace the ceasefire with a permanent peace settlement. And so actually House Resolution 152 calls for a peace agreement um, to formally end the Korean War. And we believe that, uh, unfortunately, Washington orthodoxy has it completely wrong. Um, I think whether it's called strategic patience or maximum pressure, the thinking is that putting pressure, employing more sanctions, um, using the threat of uh, military force, that these tactics, it's what's going to force North Korea to abandon its nuclear weapons. And as all the historians know well, um, North Korea doesn't have to just look at the experience of Iraq or Libya. They can look back at their own experience where the US didn't even use nuclear weapons, even though we threatened to use them during the Korean War, even though we're the ones that introduced nuclear weapons onto the Korean Peninsula in South Korea up until George uh, Sr., Bush Sr., um, that 80% of North Korean cities were decimated just by US firebombing campaigns. And so, um, I, you know, what we're calling for, and what I believe many of the world's movements are calling for, is the peace agreement, because that takes war off the table. That is going to be the thing that guarantees both American security and Korean security and is going to set forth a peace regime that could lead to denuclearization, that could lead to the improvement of human rights, but that will address immediately, I think, the security concerns that we are all concerned about, especially those of us living in Hawaii that experience the false missile threat alert. And so um, that's what we're calling for. Uh, we feel that that is a sound argument. And in fact, uh, the Korea Peace Now campaign will be coming out with a major report um, called the Path to Peace, uh, a case for a peace agreement to end the Korean War. It will come out hopefully in December. And we're going to be pushing the Biden administration to take a new approach. I believe that um, there is some opening, but it will take all of us to put the kind of pressure, especially the scholars and the academics that are knowledgeable. Um, so that's one response to the issue of the, of the declaration of ending the war. On our effectiveness, um, you know, I think first of all, we have 30 years of, of data points that show that when women's groups that are involved in peace processes, it actually leads to a peace agreement. And I believe that we have been effective in trying to normalize the concept of a peace agreement with North Korea. Um, we're not quite there, but it will take all of us, I think, you know, echoing each other and making the case that uh, what has been tried has utterly failed. And it's not just in terms of forcing North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons, but all the other human costs of the unresolved war from the tens of thousands of Korean American or Korean families that remain separated, including many Korean Americans, um, including the massive expenditures uh, on you know, preparation for war. You know, South Korea is the 10th largest military defense budget. The US has more than the next 10 countries combined. Um, here at home, we know that we are not gonna be able to achieve any of the things that we want to improve our human security if we continue to spend 53 cents of every dollar um, on the Pentagon. Um, and so the one thing I did wanna say is, you know, whether it's us meeting with North Korean women, um, or whether it's Jenny doing the uh, repatriation. Um, I did want to tell two little 
bits of, of, of stories that show how important it is for this kind of engagement to be taking place, even as small and significant, insignificant it may be to like, you know, repatriate a bag of bones. Um, but actually it was in 2000 and- I'm very sorry, Christine, but uh, in the interest of time, of time. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 hear that uh, story later. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but because uh, our original plan was uh, to finish this by 2.30 and it's already six minutes past. And we have a couple of questions asked in the Q&A and all those are very relevant and very important questions. So uh, I don't think we can pass without at least uh, giving a, a little bit of a thought on this. And uh, I will not ask all of the panelists to respond to this. I will just ask uh, Harrison uh, to cover uh, some of those uh, questions raised. If, I'm not sure whether, Harrison, you had a chance to read the uh, questions that are raised there. I will just briefly go over. Uh, one question is how would you, uh, he, uh, the, the person at Kit uh, would like to hear a little bit more about uh, the possibilities of the state exceptions and uh, there is also a question, uh, what is the important, uh, most important to engage people in order to change perspectives on North Korea? So what are the most important factors uh, to change perspectives? And, and two Koreas, uh, are they, uh, what are the roles of overseas power? And uh, there's another question, is there any way that uh, respective countries, law, North and South Korea help to set the foundation for peace. So all these questions are very relevant, but uh, I'd like to you know, ask Harrison to make a, a one or two very short point before concluding today's uh, panel discussion. And we left more questions, on, you know, uh, answering rather unanswered. Yeah. Thank you very but, much, uh, Director Peck. Um, to be just brief, and I think all the panelists here can also speak on this topic, but um, um, a, a further integration, uh, you know, this kind of vision that we have is going to require a tremendous amount of um, reshaping our own culture. Um, this, is, this goes for North Korea too, but also in South Korea and also in the United States. So it is going to be um, um, a lot of work, of course, but it is already happening. Uh, there are um, academics, writers, filmmakers, artists, and, and, and also, also youths and um, uh, civic movements that are already engaged in kind of trying to bring many cultures together, trying to create harmony and reconciliation. But it is going to be um, a, a kind of an epistemic uh, uh, revitalization. For example, how can we vision a Korean Peninsula without the U.S. military? It is it is such a, a different kind of world, but we need to have this vision, and it is of, of course already already happening. It is already happening, and uh, and I believe that the differences are uh, the, the the task is is large, but also it, but it'll be part of our um, a future task. Thank you very much. As some um, participants suggested, I don't think this will be the end of this type of event rather than a starting point of it. And uh, I am still learning how to uh, run a webinar, but now that we learned how to do it, uh, for sure, we will have more panel discussions uh, with this topic and related topic and going forward, more uh, in-depth discussions will be happening and all those will be later uh, uh, shared with also uh, broader uh, communities uh, through either uh, Facebook, YouTube, or even uh, by our website. I'd like to thank you all the panelists again for participating in this wonderful uh, discussion. And I'm sorry again for not giving enough time to you know, present uh, in more in detail, but uh, let's wait on for another opportunity. So with this, I will conclude the panel discussion session and we'll move ahead to our next session, inviting uh, Professor 
Chong In Moon uh, for our today's keynote speaker. Thank you very much for everybody. And uh, please come, uh, Professor Moon Jong In. Uh, you are already in the panelist. So I will uh, just uh, uh, reiterate the topic that Professor Moon Jong In will be uh, discussing today. It is Moon Jae In's Korea Peace Initiative Opportunities, Constraints, and Prospects. Thank you again for joining from Korea. And I'm, uh, yeah, so please present, uh, you know, uh, uh, as much as possible, but hope we will have a little bit of time to uh, ask questions uh, and to share uh, more kind of concerns that we have here. So uh, we will uh, uh, continue until 3.30. So please go ahead and welcome uh, uh, Professor Moon with a big applaud. Thank you, Mr. Ben. Can you hear me? Yes, I do. Okay, I will give just you know twenty to thirty minute talks so that we can have about twenty to thirty minutes in a uh, Q and A session. Uh, and again, you know, it is it is my great pleasure to be with you, and was particularly, you know, I was impressed by the Christ, Christine Ann's presentation. In fact, in you know, organization really helped pushing for the you know, end of war declaration in the United States. You know, it is not very welcomed in South Korea by conservative forces, but I think it is very, very important, uh, essential step toward you know, permanent peace. Hello, I'm not sure whether my computer is giving problem. I think it's Professor Moon's. Uh -huh. Okay, let's wait a little bit. Uh, but my, okay. Interruption. Uh, I'm sorry, but I, we missed you briefly, Professor Moon. Do, are you with us now? Yes, I'm with you. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So please go ahead. We, we lost you around 20 seconds, I think. So please continue. And, you know, definitely, you know, the end of war declaration is a very important step toward uh, the process or it enters to the process of denuclearization and peace and uh, building on the Korean Peninsula. And then ultimate exit will be you know, lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula. But uh, a lot of people argue, particularly in a conservative government, our conservative party in South Korea and conservative media argue that uh, an end of, end of war declaration should be an exit rather than entrance. And I don't understand their logic, but anyhow, that is the way they you know, argue. Anyhow, let me get to the, in my, you know, my talk, you know, and I was supposed to give a talk on Moon Jae-in's peace initiative, you know. Anyhow, his peace initiative is, is not his, you know, own, you know, because it is kind of cumulative outcome of, you know, existing in you know, policies, so Kim Dae-jung's sunshine policy and Noh mi peace and prosper, prosperity policy. And now, uh, you know, then, you know, Moon Jae-in was trying to, you know, continue uh, the old progressive agenda of peace and unification on the Korean Peninsula. But when he was inaugurated on May 9th, 2017, he was really bombarded by North Koreans. North Koreans really you know, test launched, you know, 15 ballistic missiles and also test launched, you know, Hassan 15 intercontinental ballistic missile on November 29th, 2017. And most importantly, North Korea tested, you know, hydrogen bomb on September 3rd, 2017. And uh, President Moon was in very, very difficult position. But on the occasion of a New Year's speech by Chairman Kim Jong-un, a new opportunity, you know, came. Uh, 
because at the time, you know, Kim Jong Un proposed that he uh, wanted to have a dialogue with the South Korea. He is willing to send his, you know, North Korean delegate to Pyeongchang Winter Olympic, and we just grabbed the opportunity. And there was a high-level talks between Pyongyang and Seoul. <clears throat> and on February, you know, ninth, you know, Kim Jong Un sent in you know, his sister Kim Il Jong as a special envoy to South Korea, and. And everything went well, and particularly President Moon Jae-in and uh, First Lady Kim Jong-suk received her very warmly. And there was a reciprocal treatment, uh, treatment. And then toward the end of the you know, Pyeongchang Olympic, the, at the closing ceremony, North Korea sent Kim jong chil Vice Chairman of Central Committee of Korea Workers' Party, as well as Head of the you know, Department of the United Front of, of the party. And his speech was very, very you know, meaningful because as a result of Kim Young Sook's visit to Seoul, uh, you know, North and South Korea could work out you know, the history visit to Pyongyang by uh, Ambassador Jung Yong and Dr. So Hoon. And that they visited Pyongyang March <coughs> 4th you know, and 5th. And then at that uh, during that in you know, a special envoy speech at Pyongyang, Kim Jong Un came up with really decisive, you know, you know what amazing decisions. You know, he's willing to have, you know, have a summit talk, you know, toward the end of April, and also <clears throat> he agreed to set up the hotline between the two leaders, and also he expressed that uh, you know, he's willing to go, willing to go for denuclearization mm -hmm. if the United States does not pose a nuclear threat to us. Uh, he even said that the denuclearization is the will of his grandfather and father. And also, in the United States does not you know, engage in, the United States and South Korea you know, do not engage in very provocative joint military exercise and training, and North Korea will be you know, restraining from, you know, restraining you know, any kinds of you know, countermeasures. And also, most importantly, you know, Chairman Kim Jong-un asked the you know, special envoys of South Korea to convey a message to President Trump. You know, he's willing to, he wanted to invite President Trump to Pyongyang and you know, he, the North Korea wanted to have a dialogue with the United States. And it was extremely successful. And then uh, three days or four days after uh, Sohun and Jong Yong returned to Seoul, you know, they you know, visited you know, Washington DC and President Trump was kind enough to meet those two special envoys in the, you know, uh, at the White House. And at the meeting, you know, it was very interesting, you know, the, you know Trump said that uh, I cannot go to Pyongyang, but I'm willing to meet, uh, you know, Chairman Kim Jong-un. Then his staff, like McMaster and uh, Matt Pottinger, they're saying that he's too premature to meet you know, Kim Jong-un and et cetera. But it is known that uh, uh, Trump said that uh, that kind of, the, the way, you know, you know he, what he said, I was told that what President Trump said was this, you know why you know, Clinton, Bush, and Obama failed? Because those presidents were listening too much, you know, words from the step like you, you know, and I want to go my own way. And that was in fact, you know, he defied you know, advisors from the National Security Advisor, McMaster, and uh, you know, the Senior Director of Asian uh, in the Affairs, you know, John uh, Matt Pottinger. And that was the beginning of it. That really opened it up. And then we conveyed a message to Pyongyang and Pyongyang responded that, uh, yes, let us have a summit talk on April 27th. You know, you know, there was a first summit between Moon Jae in and uh, Kim Jong un. And then that was followed by the you know, Singapore summit on June 12th. Okay. And then between June 12th to you know, September 19th, there was ups and downs because, as you may recall, the Secretary Pompeo visited Pyongyang and called for the declaration of all nuclear materials and missiles. And uh, Kim Jong un said that we cannot do that. You know, how can we trust you? Okay, we are building trust. If we you know, declare all our nuclear weapons and nuclear facilities. You know, there is no guarantee that you won't attack us. Therefore, before we declare and go through the verifiable, you know, uh, dismantling of nuclear weapons and nuclear missiles, you know, uh, there got to be enough, you know, trust building between the two. Therefore, 
Pompeo PG2 Pyongyang in July was not successful. And then US DPRK relations get worsened. That is why President Moon hastened his visit to Pyongyang. Originally, President Moon was thinking about visiting Pyongyang late October, but he decided to uh, go, decided to go early. And the Pyongyang summit was extremely successful. Now, I was there. I was at the Panmunjom summit as well as the Pyongyang summit. And Pyongyang summit, a lot of you know people in, in the South argued that uh, unless Chairman Kim Jong-un made his you know, verbal commitment to the denuclearization, the summit talk is a failure. And then we worked very hard to persuade Chairman Kim Jong-un make a verbal commitment. And he did. He said that, uh, okay, I agreed with President Moon Jae-in and, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, uh, to, denu to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula and, uh, and, and build the lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula. And that he, on that evening, on uh, September 19th, you know, in the evening of September 19th, and Chairman Kim Jong-un invited you know, President Moon Jae-in to May 1st Stadium and there was a, more than 150,000 North Korean citizens, Pyongyang citizens, and there came, President Moon Jae-in made a, in a speech you know, to them saying that this morning I met the your leader Kim Jong-un and we agreed to uh, denuclearize the Korean Peninsula and create a lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula, our you know, next generations of the two Koreas. And you know, those 150,000 you know, citizens showed you know, uh, unwavering, you know, you know, applause to, you know, President Moon Jae-in. Therefore, at, at that moment, we all thought that, uh, you know, Kim Jong-un is really coming to denuclearization. He's not sure, you know, because, uh, but you know, in, if you look at the past, you know, North Korean pattern, always dualistic. They're talking about the denuclearization, you know, when they had a meeting with an Americans and South Koreans, but No Dong Shim never reported, okay? And therefore, North Koreans never made it in the public. But this time, there was a no disparity, uh, no discrepancy between what North Koreans promised to South Koreans and the North Korean media coverage of events. Therefore, President Moon was really thrilled. And particularly, if you look at the, uh, in the Pyongyang Declaration, the Article 5 of the Pyongyang Declaration you know, shows very concrete measures, like uh, North Korea agreed to dismantle missile engine test site and the launching pad in Dongchangni, and also uh, Article 5 stipulate that uh, United, if United States abide by an agreement of the June 12th Singapore Declaration, North Korea is willing to dismantle all the nuclear facilities in Yangbyon permanently and completely. And that is quite a significant you know, uh, you know, step by you know, North Korea. And then what happened? And then we came back with a really, you know, great hope for peace and denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. And then February 27th and 28th, there was a second uh, summit between Trump and Kim Jong-un in Hanoi, but that didn't go, that didn't go well. You know, Kim Jong-un came to Hanoi to make a really some deal, okay. and he still was very clear. Okay, I will dismantle all the nuclear facilities in Yongbyon permanently and completely. And because the Yongbyon nuclear facilities in Yongbyon is quite significant, and Jigfried Hacker, for example, argued that that could account for the 60 to 70 percent of North Korean nuclear capabilities because it has a five megawatt nuclear reactor, it has a fuel fabrication plant, it has a reprocessing you know, plant to produce protonium, it has a, or, you know, triple you know, hydrogen, uh, uh, you know, hydrogen you know, laboratory, which is essential for the production of a hydrogen bond, okay? And also it has a highly in, in its uranium program, okay? Uh, They've all together, you know, Youngbyon has about 475 buildings. And according to Jack, Jack Fried Hacker, who visited the Youngbyon uh, four times, you know, told me that uh, it would take at least 10 years to get rid of all those 475 you know, buildings. There is, it, is, it was not an you know, insignificant offer by Kim Jong-un. 
But in return, you know, Kim Jong-un asked that the United States would lift the sanctions, uh, uh, sanctions, you know, particular sanction resolutions by UN uh, uh, Security Council since 2016. And also he added that he was not asking unconditional lifting of sanctions, is a partial lifting uh, um, on the, those resolutions which are related to civilian economy and people's livelihood. But Trump just rejected it. And his offer was this, you get rid of your nuclear missiles of all ranges, then we'll promise bright future of North Korean economy. Now, therefore, you know, American side didn't give any very concrete counter proposals. Okay, you get rid of, you dismantle nuclear, then depending on progress, then we will promise bright future of you know, your economy. There is no reason to, you know, to, for you know, Kim Jong-un to accept the counter proposal. Therefore, Trump came with a really big deal idea and he returned to no deal. But Kim Jong-un came with some concrete proposal, but it was not you know, received. Therefore, that, you know, Hanoi you know, setback has created enormous trauma on Kim Jong-un. You know, North Korea, in North Korea, you know, Suryongje, you know, and, uh, in the North Korean leadership system, the you know, leader never makes you know, mistakes. But you know, through the 2018 and Hanoi meeting, Kim Jong-un really heightened the North Korean people's expectation, but he couldn't deliver anything. They, he lost his face. Therefore, Hanoi trauma was a, quite you know, tragic on the part of North Korea. And since then on, there was no progress. You know, there was, you know, working level meeting between Steve Began and Kim Young Gil of North Korea in Stockholm on October 4th, 2019. But Kim Young Gil came just to save the face of, you know, President Trump. But his message was very clear. We'll not come back to even dialogue until the United States remove its hostile policy in North Korea that threaten our security and survival and that hampers North Korean people's right to development. Therefore North Koreans came up with in the preconditions. Unless you get rid of unless you get rid of in you know, hostile policy, we are not coming to the, any any kinds of talks. Then that since that one there was a complete in a stalemate. And then 2020, you know, particularly since, you know, North Korea crossed the border with China uh, on January 23rd, and then it crossed the border to the entire world. See, but all the flight since February 7th. Since then, there are no interactions. There is a complete stalemate. Then now, how the Moon Jae in you know, government has been, you know, approaching these this issues of denuclearization and, you know, the peace on the Korean Peninsula. You know, Moon Jae's, you know, goal is very simple and straightforward. He wanted to have nuclear weapons free, peaceful, and, you know, prosperous Korean Peninsula. Then in pursuing the goal, he has set the four basic principles. First is what? No war. We do not want war anymore on the Korean Peninsula. We should end the war on the Korean Peninsula on the occasion of 70th anniversary of the Korean War. Second, no nukes. No South Korea adopted the joint declaration uh, under the nuclearization of Korean Peninsula in 1991. Okay, and no South Korea agreed not to, you know, manufacture possess, test, transfer nuclear weapons. But North Korea is going, has gone for the nuclear weapon. But South Korea has abided by the joint declaration of the denuclearization of Korean Peninsula. Therefore, our government position is let us return to the joint declaration. Therefore, no nukes. Third, no regime change. Moon Jae-in went to Berlin on July 6th. 2017, he made it very clear. 
We are not interested in changing regime in North Korea. Okay. We want coexistence with North Korea. We recognize North Korean regime. There's no regime change. Third. And fourth mm. is what? The birch of exchanging cooperation and reconciliation. That is in fact, in fact the continuation of you know, Kim Dae-jung and Nong Hyun policy. Finally, you know, Moon Jae-in has been arguing the importance of international collaboration in solving the Korean Peninsula problem. You, with those five, you know, four principles, uh, five principles, then he set, you know, four major strategies. First strategy is a peace keeping strategy. How to keep peace on the Korean Peninsula? He was, has been following orthodox approach. We should build a, military deterrence. And that was particularly because of what North Korea did in 2017. Because he, at a time, Moon Jae-in promised a lot of things for building credible nuclear uh, military deterrence. Okay. And second, strengthening of alliance with the United States, including extended, you know, uh, extended nuclear deterrence. Therefore, those two, you know, Military deterrence and strengthening of alliance has become one of the core of uh, you know, keeping peace on the Korean Peninsula. But at the same time, as Christine Ann pointed out, President Moon Jae-in has been emphasizing the, you know, the strategy of peacemaking, reducing tension and building confidence and adopting end of war declaration and transforming Amistice agreement into some sort of peace agreement and pursuing denuclearization and creating or realizing a you know, lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula. That, that is so called peacemaking approach. And peacemaking, you would usually, you know, it was predicated on the simultaneous pursuit of denuclearization and peacemaking on the Korean Peninsula. The other one is so-called the peace building approach. It is a peaceful economy. And Moon Jae-in, President Moon Jae-in has been arguing that the peace economy or uh, new Korean Peninsula ge economic geography. The his basic argument is this. Let us make a railroad connection. Let us make energy networks, okay? And let us promote economic corporations. Which, through which we can have, uh, you know, improved exchange and cooperation and confidence building. And even we can have economic, you know, community between the North and the South. And then that will, you know, pave way to perpetual peace on the Korean Peninsula. There is a third strategy. And finally, proactive diplomacy. You know, President Moon Jae-in hate to be, hate to see South Korea being sandwiched, or South Korea being passed by major powers, even by North Koreans. Therefore, he wanted to take a you know, more proactive leadership in pursuing diplomacy. Those are the four major strategies. Then what are the you know, outcomes? It's very mixed outcomes, okay? Anyhow, 2017, we witnessed the year of crisis, 2018, we witnessed the year of hope. And 2019 and afterwards, there is a stalemate. Now, hope is dissipating, and there is a growing you know, feeling of resignation by South Koreans on the prospect of peace. Then what went wrong? Obviously, first one is what? There is a there has been a contradiction between peacemaking and Peacekeeping, you know, while strengthening our defense capability. In fact, Christine, Christine said that uh, Korea is now 10th tenth largest you know, military power in the world. In fact, the sixth largest you know, military power in the world in terms of defense spending. We are acquiring global hall. You know, we have acquired F-35 stealth you know, fighter. Okay, now we are going for the nuclear submarine. We are going for the, you know, uh, lighter career, aircraft career. 
on the one hand, uh, we are building military power, and then now on the other hand, we want to have a talk with North Korea. North Korea won't like it. Therefore, there is a contradiction between peacekeeping and peacemaking. Second problem is this. There is a complete incompatibility between denuclearization, process of denuclearization and uh, peacemaking, because we have been you know, pushing for the simultaneous pursuit of denuclearization and peacemaking, but there is no progress in peacemaking, uh, denuclearization. Consequently, there is no progress in denuclearization too. And third one, when you talk about peace building through economy, then there got to be economic exchanges with North Korea. There got to be trade and investment in North Korea, but we cannot do that. Why? Because of international sanction regime. Okay. United Nations, you know, Security Council sanction resolutions, American unilateral sanction, and plus American threat to use a secondary boycott have virtually you know, blocked our economic exchange and cooperation with North Korea. Therefore, in other words, President Moon came up with all the beautiful slogans and promises and whatever, but nothing could be done. And that is why North Korea is so angry about it. Okay. Of course, you know, when Kim Yo Jong blew up our liaison office in Kaesong, you know, she was citing all this, you know, provocation by North Korean defectors in terms of, you know, uh, the, you know the, the, with the dissemination of all these in you know, the propaganda materials, anti-North Korean propaganda materials along the you know, border. But that is a nominal one. But on the other one, that could be the result of you know, the, the or expression of North Korean disillusionment with the South Korea, because South Korea promised so many things, the Panmunjom Declaration, Pyongyang Declaration, but nothing was done. Even not a humanitarian assistance, even we failed to deliver Tommy flu you know, the vaccine for the, you know, African, you know, pig, you know, flu, okay. Therefore, there was a great sense of dis disappointment and disillusionment on the part of North Korea. Then now, you know, what to be done, you know, since I spent more than 30 minutes, <laughs> I should stop very quickly, you know. Obviously, you know, the President Moon, you know, now, he, you know, his reign is less than one and a half years, you know, therefore, I don't know to what extent he has a leverage, but still, he's, he's a one-term president, therefore, he can do whatever he wants, because he's not going for the, the re-election, therefore, he should show more decisive leadership in dealing with North Korea, okay, even if he makes some kinds of, you know, the conflict with the United States, you know, he should have taken more, you know, really proactive, you know, policy and attitude on North Korea, but that part is missing. And I hope, still hope that President Moon, you know, show that kind of leadership for the remainder of his reign. Second, the United States got to be more realistic in dealing with North Korea. You know, Christian Ahn is right. It's just a normative issue. Okay. You know, whether you like it or not, North Korea has nuclear weapons. It has a delivery capability. Okay. That's a reality. You cannot tell North Koreans get rid of them first, then I will recognize you, I'll give you something. North Korea will never follow it. Therefore, there got to be, you know, step by step, simultaneous, simultaneous and simultaneous exchanges, okay, based on the principle of action for action. Otherwise, There's no other you know, way to solve the problem. But the American problem is what? You know, it has been the, in the typical pattern, even under the Biden administration, I think I, I'm afraid that the same mistake would take place. First, demonizing North Korea. Second, underestimating North Korea. Third, overestimating North Korea. Okay. And working on the whisper thinking. Okay. Never recognizing past failures. Therefore, Americans never learn from the past mistakes because they always argue that it's a North Korean mistakes, okay? North Korean cheating, not ours. We 
have been dealing with North Koreans with the sincerity, authenticity, but I doubt, you know, therefore, you know, there had to be really, you know, I really hope that, uh, you know, the Biden administration would go much more to, you know, uh, scrutinize the, in the policy review process and try to admit past mistakes, be real, be flexible. Okay. It is not realistic, you know, for the US to expect North Koreans voluntarily dismantle, you know, uh, nuclear weapons and missiles in advance. No. Okay. And also, the US got to be flexible. Sanctions. American policy has been sanctioned for the sake of sanction. Sanctions are tools, instruments to achieve certain policy goals, meaning what the nuclearization of North Korea. The United States got to use sanctions more strategically. But now in Washington, there is a sanctioned cult. It, is, it has become like a religion. Okay? It has become untouchable. And on North Korea, also North Korea should you know, get out of its you know, old bad habit. They think the South Korea is nothing but a puppet of the United States. Therefore, they believe they should talk to the Washington directly. That's wrong. And uh, 2018 clearly showed that uh, it is a South Korean facilitated, facilitating role that brought Trump and Kim Jong-un together. Same thing will happen to you know, President Biden too. Okay. If North Korea talk with the South Korea, then South Korea will be in much better position to persuade and convince President Biden and his staff. In particular, under the current setting, there is, it is highly unlikely that the, the Biden administration would engage in high level talks with North Korea. Therefore, I think that North Korea should talk with the South Korea first, should come up with some kinds of joint collective wisdom in dealing with the United States, that is the way we can solve the problem. But overall, in conclusion, you know, things are not very promising, okay? A lot of people talk about uh, Biden, you know, Moon Jae-in, they are all liberal, progressive, you know, political parties, therefore there's a commonality and whatever. I don't think so, okay? There are a lot of differences too. And also Moon Jae-in government has just one and a half years left. Okay. I don't know to what extent they can coordinate. You know, you know, American process, you know. Now they start with the transition team, the inauguration. I hope that the you know Biden get inaugurated on January 21st. And then there is a whole, you know, appointment of a key post at the State Department. And there's a confirmation, you know, a hearing at the Senate. This process can last six to seven months. And meanwhile, U.S. may not do anything. Then North, there is a good chance for North Korea to engage in, in a so-called in a provocative behavior. Therefore, in other, on the on the part of North Korea, you know, it got to North Korea got to be patient, and then don't engage in what West called the provocative behavior. Therefore, no, no the best thing we say test launching, no nuclear testing, or any other kinds of so-called, you know, uh, aggressive behavior, okay? And talk to the South Korea, to talk to South Korea. That is the way we can solve the problem. Therefore, everything seems uncertain, but I'm born optimist. And I hope that the President Moon Jae-in can come up with some positive results so that he would transfer his government to next to the government with lesser liabilities and uh, uh, with lesser liabilities. Thank you. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Dr. Moon, Professor Moon. Uh, this is really a uh, good opportunity for us to learn what uh, South Korean government had done and what is uh, the current position and what are the related issues that when we deal with the North Korea and also uh, nuclear challenges and what we can do uh, for uh, the future achieve, to achieve peace and also a further uh, prosperity in the region. And I, I think we can have some uh, discussions together. So those who, uh, panelists who are currently 
around, you might turn on your camera as well. And I will change the view from speaker view to panelist view. Uh, I will start first with a, a couple of questions and uh, those uh, panelists may also uh, jump in to ask question uh, in person. And in the meantime, I will con continue to collect the questions from other panelists, uh, I mean, attendees and also through the emails. Uh, I have a, uh, one key question. Actually, this question I have had in mind for a long time, and I, I don't have a clear answer yet. So uh, now that I have a, a Professor Moon in front of me, I really want to uh, know what you think about this. So personally, uh, when we discuss nuclear weapon issues, it is, uh, to me, somewhat ironical because uh, during tr uh, Trump administration, actually, we have seen uh, increased armed races between the United States and uh, Russia, and also uh, China. Nuclear, nuclear testing was uh, continuing uh, actually uh, in those countries. And uh, nuclear development, not disarm, uh, reduction of it, but development has been continuing. And modernization of the nuclear weapon is one of the key uh, uh, policy of the United States as well. And so my question is, what is the nature of the nuclear problem that North Korea is raising? And, uh, and one of the reasons why I'm asking this question is uh, in the past, is it because North Korea is uh, some kind of uh, uh, excuse to use to raise the security concern in North Korea stage and not because North Korea nuclear threat itself is so key? especially the United States and uh, don't want to really become in an odd position against Russia and China for a long time. But now we see the increasing tension between the United States and China. And uh, while uh, North Korea nuclear weapon discussion had gone a little bit kind of less popular, I think, last, at least a couple of months or a year. So I was wondering whether North Korea nuclear weapon issue will be exactly the same as it was in Trump administration, or whether uh, it's possible for the United States government with the new, new president, uh, go back to the benign neglect or strategic kind of, you know, resistant, what was the, yes. Patience. The patience, yes. So those, <clears throat> those type of uh, kind of, uh, avoiding this issue is possible, or uh, whether China, depending upon China's policy, whether North Korea will, uh, nuclear weapon will be, issue will be the main issue rather than uh, reconciliation or economic pros co prosperity or re uh, normalization of relationship. So I would like to first assess the nature of this problem. What do you think about this? Actually, your, your question, uh, really twofold. One is why North Korea is having nuclear weapons, and, and another one is uh, what should be the American response. And as to the, you know, when I talk to the North Koreans, and their position is very clear. You now, if there is any tension or escalation of one the Korean Peninsula, United States will be taking you know attack on North Korea. That attack will be nuclear attack. That's why we should have nuclear weapons so that we can create uh, some minimal nuclear deterrence. That is a, the first reason. Second reason, economic reason. There is a no way, no way for North Korea to match with South Korea in conventional arms race. We are rich. We are about 40 to 50 times bigger than North Korean economy. Okay. We are spending more than 10 times than North Korean in terms of conventional weapons. There's no way North Korea to match with South Korea. Then having nuclear weapons or WMD, weapons of mass destruction, is economically much more feasible choice for North Koreans. Third, obviously, in regime dynamics, okay, having nuclear weapons, Kim Jong un can co opt and consolidate the military, okay, because the nuclear weapons will be very important institutional interest of North Korean military, okay, and then he can boost okay, his domestic image. So that that can help the legitimacy building. Another reason, international prestige and bargaining. 
the U.S. would never respond to North Korea unless North Korea shows that it has nuclear strike capability. Okay. There is another in the part of the so-called very. I really don't understand American behavior. America, same thing. Unless America got a stimulus from outside, U.S. wouldn't wouldn't work. Okay. And then North Korea has mastered it, and therefore they always use this kind of sti stimulus in a method on the U.S. But those are the kinds of reasons why they ha they're having it. Therefore, you know, they genuinely believe. And then I really, I when I talked with the very senior North Korean guys, I really don't think the United States would use in the nuclear weapons against you. The U.S. has more than 6,000 nuclear warhead. You have just what, 10, 10 to 20 maximum 60. There is a fundamental asymmetry between you and the United States. How the hell are they going to use it? But they said it, our memory of Korean War, US Air Force virtually destroyed entire Pyongyang. Then memory still lingers. The US would do whatever method to defeat and destroy North Korea. They did their belief. And also, even if they have even one nuclear bomb, that if it is effectively used, they believe they can create a nuclear deterrence. Now, going back to the, your second question, what the U.S. would do that? If North, the United States adopt in a Biden administration, adopt all the strategic patients, okay, that will be really, you know, self-defeating. In in the in Washington, there are three contending views. One is what I call the denuclearization paradigm. That means what? North Korea, you dismantle nuclear first, then we'll reward you. There's a mainstream you know, folks, as well as a so-called area specialist in Washington, they support that idea. Okay. Even not an inch of progress without North Korean denuclearization first. Second approach is what? So-called the management approach. Okay. That means what? North Korea, given current hardships, economic sanctions, natural disaster, pandemic. You know, North Korea cannot survive longer. Therefore, as Professor Beck pointed out, uh, so-called benign neglect, even malign neglect, uh, neglect, okay, will lead to the regime change in North Korea and ultimate solution to North Korea nuclear problem. Okay, this kind of whisper thinking approach, okay, the other approach is a nuclear arms control approach. That approach is different. Second approach argued that the time is on our side, not on North Korean side. But third approach argued that no, time is on North Korean side or time is on nobody's side. North Korea will continue to build its nuclear capability and China will never let North Korea go collapse. And even in South Korea, Okay, there will be a division on how to deal with North Korea. Okay. Therefore, time is not necessarily on our side. Therefore, we should engage with North Korea, have a dialogue and negotiation with North Korea. And we got to pursue a more realistic approach, flexible approach. Sanction, not for the sake of sanction, but for the realization of our policy goal, meaning denuclearization. Okay. Simultaneous an incremental approach to the problem. But I, what is ironical is this, in old days, non-nuclear proliferation experts, they were the most hardline people. They were the denuclearization first, you know, advocate. Now, all of a sudden now, this nuclear non-proliferation specialists have become advocate of this nuclear arms control approach. If I don't know to what extent, President-elect Biden listened to. If we if we listen to the so-called area specialist and mainstream foreign policy specialist, I would say he will fail. But if we listen to non-proliferation specialist, if we listen to them, then I think that there is a chance for major breakthrough and progress in North Korea's denuclearization. I'm sorry, I give it too long answers to your short questions. Thank you very much. And you also alluded that uh, 
Moon Jae-in government may do take some more decisive act uh, because he is not seeking any re-election and his term still has uh, some some time to do pursue new things. And one of the question raised is uh, whether uh, the strategy better apology than ask permission uh, would work or not. And as you know, uh, in the past, uh, Sung Man Lee uh, had done take some decisive measure in dealing with the uh, prisoner of war of Korean uh, war period. And uh, uh, we also uh, know that uh, there is also some, some uh, demand in Korea that uh, South Korea should not be uh, too much just uh, uh, abided by uh, kind of restricted by the sanction, US sanction or UN sanction and others, because those are really some unreasonable restriction in terms of pursuing any inter-Korea uh, reconciliation measure. So uh, is the, but uh, on the other hand, we have been hearing that US uh, efforts to go, go hand in hand with the, the United, uh, South Korean government, and also uh, US fear that, that South Korea should, uh, may not, you know, take any uh, unilateral action is also a very important factor. So what do you think? Is, is the U.S. influence so decisive in making decisions in Korea? Yeah, to some extent, you know, but, uh, but we cannot defy sanction resolutions by the United Nations or sanction measures taken by the United States. But we do not know that there are lots of areas we can engage with North Korea, which are not affected by the sanction resolutions um, or American sanction policy, humanitarian assistance, or the simple choice by the individuals. Okay? Even for example, railroad connection, State Department gave a green signal that we can go ahead with the railroad connection. But the problem was this, that agreement came too late. And also particularly during the heyday of 2018, we should have done a lot of so-called the cooperative works with North Korea, but we didn't do that. Then starting from November, 2018, United States proposed the so-called ROK US working group and our ROK US working group even was interfering with humanitarian assistance to North Korea, but our government didn't have a gut to say no to the United States. Then we lost the momentum. And the North Korea since then, and since February, end of the Hanoi summit in February 2019, North Korea was not responding. Yet. You know, we had lost, you know, you know, lost opportunity. But even now, you know, once President Moon says, okay, or out on January 7th, he said that I will go for the, you know, uh, individual tourism and uh, railroad connection and, you know, the peaceful use of demilitarized zone whatever, but the mm -hmm. point was this North Korea not responding because of pandemic. Therefore, my, uh, my guess is this, you know, North Korea is likely to have eight party, eighth party Congress sometime January 7th or 8th. And after that, North Korea will come with a new policy line. Then that could be a, a new, there could be new opportunity for inter-Korean exchange and cooperation. But, I don't know to what extent the Biden administration will put the brake on us and to what extent the Moon Jae-in government will have a gut to go ahead within, ex ex within ex existing international sanction regime. We, have, we can do a lot of things if we, even under the sanction regime, but we didn't do anything. Thank you very much. And one of the related question is whether South Korean government has, has confidence in North Korean government's intention to uh, follow the agreements that were made. Yeah, well, you know, the, I attended in the Panmunjom summit and I attended Pyongyang summit. They're, they're really committed, you know. Therefore, whenever a lot of people ask me, or oh, do you really believe that North Korea would give up nuclear weapons? And I usually answer in this way, up until Pyongyang, September 2018, yeah, I really witnessed North Korean willingness, North Korean leaders' willingness to give up nuclear weapons. Now, I don't know.
Thank you very much. So we have uh, several uh, panelists and participants. So is there anybody who wants to say something at this stage? You may raise your hand. And uh, I have heard, uh, received an email from my colleague, uh, Professor Chris Baer. I'm not sure whether you are still around. And if you are, you might just say something. Uh, I just uh, called you. So can you, or is there anybody else who wants to ask any question or any comments to make? Yes, Prof, uh, Dr. Jo, go ahead, please, you first. Yes, uh, so your comment about North Korea nuclear challenge is an excuse for some countries to expand their influence, uh, mainly US or Japan. I just like to point out that's the tragedy of a security dilemma, the typical case that the, so uh, Shinzo Abe, uh, uh, tried to revise uh, the, the constitution. He didn't succeed, but he greatly uh, expanded uh, Japanese uh, military forces operational range. Uh, and his, his reason to J uh, Japanese people was the increasing threat from North Korea and also the rise of uh, military uh, Chinese, China's might. Um, so from Japanese perspective, it is a reasonable uh, threat. And then uh, the Shinzo Abe government has to respond. But it is not perceived in that way in South Korea or China. It is the sign of a militarism, a revival of militarism uh, from Japan. And also when North Korea uh, 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 bombed the Yongpyeong, uh, the, uh, the bombed the Yongpyeong Island and then uh, the also torpedo attack uh, Chonan uh, neighborship in 2010, the US response was to increase the military exercise with South Korea. And then one idea was to deploy uh, the USS uh, aircraft carrier George Washington to Yellow Sea. And that increased uh, Beijing's threat perception about the US. Uh, from US perspective, it is a legitimate response to the increased threat from North Korea. Same with the 2017 threat, but it is not perceived in that way in Beijing. It is an endless argument Washington will keep saying that we don't have any intention to uh, target China. Uh, I believe it is true. But from Beijing, Beijing's perspective, it is also understandable that they should worry about the possibility of uh, the US uh, conspiracy. So that's the nature of North Korean nuclear challenge that is deepening the security dilemma among all the countries. And then I think it is uh, uh, almost tragic that we should end up just uh, distrust, trust, distrusting each other. Uh, and then about uh, the US, I'd like to add some, uh, a little bit about US foreign policy about North Korea during Trump administration. And I have to say that this is my personal opinion, not the US uh, Department, uh, De Department of Defense. So I agree with uh, uh, Professor Moon's observation that uh, President Trump just walked away. Uh, it was uh, too much, uh, too much provocative to uh, Kim Jong-un's uh, eyes, maybe. Maybe it is the, the art of deal uh, trick. I'm not sure if it, if, if it was a part of a long-term strategy. But one, one clear sign I, I detect after the Hanoi summit was that there was a more and more discussion within Washington, and I believe also within the government that it is, uh, as Professor Moon pointed out, it is not realistic that we demand denuclearization first before we start to lifting out the lifting up the, the sanctions. Uh, the Trump administration did not say that, but there are signs that even President Trump himself said that under the big uh, strategy, we can start smaller deals. And also uh, state uh, uh, Department of State after COVID-19 mentioned several times that US is willing to support North Korea if it is uh, having a hard time from COVID-19. Uh, and also uh, the US government also sent uh, uh, Stephen Began. Uh, I believe that it was an intent to have a communication with Pyongyang. So the point is that despite the talk of uh, maximum pressure and denuclearization force, there have been practical moves that Washington tries to communicate with Pyongyang uh, precisely to implement phased approach. And I think a Biden administration will more explicitly pursue phased approach, but the difference is that it will not be top-down big bill approach. It will be more of the bottom up uh, from the working level, step-by-step -step move. And then I'm not sure if it is, it is really good news for Kim Jong-un, uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un actually. 
uh, at the phased, phased approach, t for tet at the working level may be even harder for Kim Jong-un regime. So that is something I, I think we have to uh, see. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. Is there anybody else who wants to say, uh, add some comments or any question? Uh, I don't see any at this time. Am I missing anyone? Okay. Otherwise, uh, I will just uh, uh, ask Professor Moon what, uh, to make a final conclusive remark before we uh, end this, this session. Yeah, but, uh, as to the, you know, <clears throat> Professor Joe's comments and whatever, the whole point is this, you know, there is a huge you know, trust gap and also, now, uh, Mike Pompeo says, oh, okay, we will allow humanitarian assistance to North Korea and whatever, but the State Department has shown the huge gap between their words and deeds. Okay. And Steve Biggins were, you know, words never been carried out. Therefore, North Koreans do not, do not want to be fooled again. You know, whatever they say, then in the process, then they come up with other kinds of excuses. Therefore, North Korean working level people really afraid of dealing with, the, you know, Americans because when they fail to deliver, then they will be liable, then they will be punished. The reason why the North Koreans do not want a working level meeting is because of that accountability problem. In America, even working level people did, you know, do not deliver concrete outcomes that, that they, they will be, you know, you know that they, they can be pardoned, okay? There's no sort of issue of responsibility and accountability on their part, but in North Korea, it's very serious business. The finance, they got to understand the North Korean decision-making structure. This is why North Koreans have, have always been saying that our, our leader, Sri Young, should make a decision. Top level is approach. Top, top level approach is about much more acceptable. And South Korea understand the North Korean decision-making structure. That is why we have been telling Americans it is better for a leader to have a direct talk with Kim Jong-un. Therefore, when President Moon Jae-in had a talk with you know, Joe Biden yesterday, he was telling the same thing. You got to talk with, you know, Chairman Kim Jong-un directly. You know, working level talk won't work, I don't know. Because North Korea working level people will not come to the negotiation table. Therefore, then, then that really goes back to another important you know, issue. That is what? You got to understand North Korea. You got to have intersubjective understanding of North Korea, what we Koreans call the Yokji Saji. But Washington doesn't have that kinds of attitude. Okay. Look in the whole, for example, Chung Park at Brookings Institution. You read his her book, Becoming you know, Kim Jong-un. You'll be surprised to see, to read that book. I doubt whether to what extent she understands North Korea. But she was, you know, key. North Korean analysis and CIA, okay? Now she's, she's the number one advisor North Korean issue to, you know, President-elect Joe Biden. Therefore, you know, that is why the expert like you should, you know, raise your voices and tell the you know, new administration in the United States, you gotta have a better understanding of North Korea. You know, University of Hawaii has a really good outrage of the North Korean specialist. Okay, I'll stop here. I talk too much. Okay. Thank you very much. I just try to promote all of the attendee to a panelist. Some of them are here, but with a, a camera off. But I, uh, I am very frustrated with this uh, webinar function because webinar doesn't allow uh, us to enjoy our community. If it, were, it had happened here at the center where I'm currently sitting, uh, we could have said, you know, for personal things. And after this meet, uh, presentation, we could have asked more kind of private setting, uh, in private setting, more questions, but it's not possible. And even we don't appreciate who are, you know, next to us at this time. But at least I just wanted to show you and also appreciate that everybody here are thinking the same questions after 70 years of uh, atrocity that Korean people had uh, experienced. And also the United States were really key uh, actor in that historical you know, incident. And uh, uh, 
we still see uh, a lot of uh, legacies, a lot of uh, unresolved questions after 70 years. And probably it is also one of the key uh, issue in the world in terms of dealing with security of the, and peace uh, of the world. So uh, this is very, very, very good uh, starting point of our discussion to think continuously. And I hope we will do have a similar event uh, to commemorate the, the armistice agreement, I think, after three years. And if, even before, we will have more chance to think about the uh, Korean War. And all these were possible because of the participants and audiences, but also our distinguished uh, guests uh, who made a welcoming remark and panel discussions. And most importantly, Professor Moon, who gave a keynote speech with a really used uh, in a rich uh, you know, uh, discussion on this important matter. So thank you again for all of your efforts and all of your wonderful contribution to make this event possible. And I hope we will continue this dialogue and uh, uh, we, I, I will make this discussion available first uh, through online, but let's continue this discussion. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.